really what we need is, is to be able to have the language, to, for people to tell stories, for people to feel safe, to be their whole selves when they come to work. And, and you really only get that by creating a safe, engaging environment where there's curiosity about everybody and uh, there's empathy and a more a deep humanistic uh, view of the world. If you just rely on policies, that's not going to change anything. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is certainly one of my favorite moments here, being at Davos, having a conversation with this lovely woman. Thank you um, for sharing this space and sharing this moment um, to be here and certainly in a conversation that I certainly believe that, that um, there's much needed conversation, right? Um, so again, thank you. My name is Gina Rosero. I am I'm a model, I'm a producer, I'm an out and proud transgender woman in the world, um, which is interesting that for so long, and certainly we will be talking about more of that story, about what had happened to me, my journey in coming out, and what I'm doing now. But I am joined here with this incredible woman, Jill Ader. She's the chairwoman of Egon Zender. And I think the, the, the I, I want to frame this first, I think, in, in the context of what is happening now globally, especially um, as companies deal with so many different, as a multinational company, you deal with different contexts when it comes to LGBTI rights. How does it work if you know, a company is very progressive in, in Western context and then they, they work in um, local context where countries does not fully support LGBTI rights, right? So we're really gonna break those down. And I think um, there, is, there is a study that says that more than half of employees at this moment still choose, as much as we're having conversations about LGBTI rights, we see it more in, in culture, still more than half of employees chooses not to fully express their sexual orientation and gender identity at work, mm -hmm. right? There is a 2017 UNAIDS study that basically says it will cost company $100 billion a year for companies that doesn't fully support, you know, these are the costs when you don't support LGBTI rights. Also, I think it's important to have the, uh, the context. Um, most of the time when people talk about global LGBTI rights, they usually talk about in many spaces, um, just talking about that there's more than 70 countries all over the world that criminalizes homosexuality. But also, as a proud trans woman myself, I think what usually tends to get lost is a conversation about what happens that when we don't talk about transgender rights as well. Like in many countries all over the world, trans people are not even allowed to exist, meaning most places all over the world, there are no policies that could simply change a trans person's name and gender marker in the legal documents. So these are the frameworks that we will be talking about. And I want to first ask you, Jill, as a leader, as a chairwoman of, um, what are, you know, in your, as, in your position as a leader, what are some of those um, moments in your journey that have created change, especially when it comes to advocating for LGBTI rights? Mm. Well, I, and we, in Egon Center, we deal with uh, leadership. So it's uh, finding leaders and developing leaders in their teams. So clearly the topics of conversation have generally been about gender diversity. We all talk about more women on boards and in the workplace. And I think this is, this is now becoming a conversation, but in many corporates, the conversation has been about gender diversity or ethnic diversity. So I think what, what we're trying to do is help organizations have the right conversations. So um, what I would say is, um, if, if, you, if you think about um, global organizations today, um, they know that when they're doing a spec for the role that they have, they, they, don't, they, they might say gender. Um, very, very occasionally they say ethnicity. I have never in all the time, I've been 23 years in this industry, never had a client say to me, please bring transgender LGBT to the table. Mm. And part of that, it's difficult, and it's difficult in our industry because LGBT can be open and uh, very obvious, but actually many times it's invisible, even if they have come out. And so it's quite difficult for us, and in the industry, 
you cannot record someone's sexuality and uh, gender markup in, on, on computers. So, yeah. you know, you're, you're stuck. You can't search for it. So it's quite a complicated thing for our industry to, to deal with. But I remember back, funnily, to my very first year with Egon Zender. And um, my, the partner who mentored me was a senior partner in New York. And, uh, and he was openly gay. And it was, he was probably the best mentor I've ever had in my life. Um, and during that first year, I hired two LGBT candidates. Mm. And to me, it was just, well, that's, that's pretty normal. Um, but, I mean, if I think of the conversations that I've had subsequently, I, don't, I think a lot of leaders really struggle to know how to have the conversation. They get confused by the terminology. They get embarrassed that they don't know en enough. And many leaders love to know everything, um, which is not a recipe for success today. But when they don't, it brings a barrier between them. So I think, I think there's is a complicated issue for leadership. Yeah, I like what you said about you know having the initial. Um, and the, the partner that, that you've had and, yeah. and what that meant for you, right? Yeah. I mean, I, per, for me personally, um, you know, when I moved to New York City, I'm, I was born and raised in the Philippines. When I moved to New York City in 2005, I wanted to pursue a modeling career. And context is everything, right? Um, I made the decision in 2005 to, you know, go big or go home. You, you move to New York City if you want to be a fashion model. But at that time, there was not an out trans fashion model. It was not allowed. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine what that presented for me. Yes, I had a dream. I was born and raised in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I had this big thought, like, I'm going to make it in New York City, right? I made the decision to actually not share to my model agent that, I was, that I'm trans. My, so for about seven years, I was a fashion model, and my model agent did not know I was trans. Yes, it was amazing that mm -hmm. I was working, I was living my dream. I grew up in a tiny little alley in the Philippines. Here I am in New York City in covers of magazine, right? But you could imagine the implications of almost always trying to limit myself yeah. in fully expressing myself. And I'm working in fashion, right? This is an industry that is the most visual. It is the it's an industry that's all about the power of visibility, but I was not being seen, yeah. right? It's like that, that deep understanding that, and always questioning, when am I going to be allowed to come out? Mm -hmm. Because it was not allowed. Um, the fashion model, the transgender fashion models that came out, the ones who basically paved the way for me, when they got outed, their careers disappeared. Mm -hmm. So certainly there's, progress that have happened, right? But still, in many places around the world, whether in working um, environments in multinational um, companies, many challenges. And I want to ask you, what are some of the challenges that you face in implementing, whether it's in a local um, context, in yeah. the environments that you, that you work at, especially when it comes to implement, <coughs> implementing policies to advocating for LGBT rights? Yeah. Well, I think. Um, Many companies are going down the road of, of having the right policies. Um, in fact, I was speaking to one CEO yesterday who's got 100 on the index. He's really proud of it. But he said it, it feels a little bit uh, insincere mm -hmm. because all we have are the right policies. They're in 80-something countries. But having the policies alone is not enough. Um, so I think really what we need is, is to be able to have the language to, for people to tell stories, for people to feel safe, to be their whole selves when they come to work. And, and you really only get that by creating a safe, engaging environment where there's curiosity about everybody, and uh, there's empathy, and a more a deep humanistic uh, view of the world. If you just rely on policies, that's not going to change anything. Yeah. You might get a tick in the box, <laughs> and that looks good, but that's it really just. It, I think it could really just go so far, and it's funny you're saying that because, I mean, personally, when I when I decided to finally tell my story to the world, when that emotional toll that I was feeling of mm. of loneliness that I felt that you know thinking that 
is it is this it for me? Mm -hmm. Is it really it for me? But when I decided to tell my story to the world, I, I gave a TED talk in 2014, a talk that changed my life. I, I knew that I wanted to make this bigger. Mm -hmm. And you were saying about policy because I knew that growing up in the Philippines, a lot of places all over the world, there are no policies that, that would support trans rights specifically. And then for the next two years, I worked with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to have worked with President Obama's State Department, USAID, like the big global um, bodies that are mm -hmm. working on these issues. But most of the time, I would find myself in a room about big policy decisions that concerns LGBTI rights globally, and I'm usually the only trans person in, in the a room. room. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's been felt othered, I'm sure we've all gone to those moments where we're like, yes, this may be great, but also at the same time, mm -hmm. what's lacking is those new ones. Like nothing like a statistic. It's great to have statistics and reports. But I think what usually gets lost are those stories. And you point that out because there are people behind those statistics, right? When we talk about how many percent of people being discriminated, I think what's really, truly important is to go deep mm -hmm. into those nuances and those stories. And I wonder if, if you could share some of those stories that some employees that, um, that you've worked with that have shared their stories or maybe even, you know, some some progress that you know that when 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 you all have implemented LGBTI rights in yeah. your company, what are some of those stories that I think yeah. that was so critical and that that you learned from? Well, we I mean we at Econ's under we have several um, transgender LGBT uh, leaders in the firm, and that's fantastic because it means we've got role models. And if you don't have role models, it's really difficult. So we would love to help more people, leaders that we deal with around the world to be able to tell their story. Because if you're living a life where a lot of your energy is being consumed by pretending not to be anything mm -hmm. other than what's expected of you, that is so draining. It's not good for mental or physical health. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, at the moment, we're um, on a, a journey to interview 50 leaders around the world who are out and proud of it and help them tell their stories so that more people feel that they can do it. So, yes, we're helping on policies, um, but more than that, we think it's about storytelling, which is what you've said. And uh, one, uh, one of those stories, um, and he's very happy for me to mention him, is, uh, is Dolph, who's CEO of um, Staples Solutions. Do you, do you know him? He's, um, he came out um, after school. Um, then he got a job and realized he was ambitious. And, um, and decided that he was not, was not going to do that anymore. And so really he sort of hid it from the world until one night, working late, one of his colleagues came up to him and said, when are you going to tell us, Dolph, about who you really are? <laughs> because we're, we're, that's, that's who we want to see. You can only be authentic as a leader if we know who you are. Um, subsequently, he went. He said he went back into the closet, is how he described it, um, and then came back out and led a turnaround, a business that was about to fail. And he says now that if he hadn't been him, his whole self, there's no way that he would have come through that journey, because you you haven't got the energy and the time to pretend to be anything other than who you are, and it creates empathy. And this is one of the reasons that he goes under why we think if you're looking for courageous re leaders, if you're looking for leaders who can really engage at an emotional level and be empathetic and curious about other people, this is a very brilliant talent pool and why would we not, you know, why would we not go for that? Certainly, and you know, it's almost alluding to the fact that there's literally a economic cost, right? If you don't allow employees to be fully themselves, yes. Right, and the empathy that you mentioned um, is, is critical, and it kind of also covering this notion of representation, right? I mean, it's so critical. I mean, I, I work in, I have a production company. I produce stories <coughs> about, you know, LGBT people, transgender youth, uh, people of color, 
For me, you know, at, at a moment in time when for so long I was not allowed to be myself, and the moment I came out and all of a sudden there was this big shift on my mindset that all of a sudden I want to do everything, I could do everything, right? And like that one simple mind shift of because I'm now allowed to be fully myself and, and the work that I do having a production company, it is so critical for me that when I'm producing a story as a producer is that the people or the stories that I'm mm -hmm. telling also represents the people behind the scene, yes. right? And, and what you've mentioned about having more people tell their story, it is, it, it's just so powerful, yes. right? It is, and I travel the world speaking about, you know, obviously LGBTI rights, trans rights, and people always tell me, why do you want to continue telling this story? Why do you want to continue telling your story? What, what kind of challenges that you face if people don't agree with you? I always tell them, I'm telling my lived experience, my personal story. How could you deny a person of their personal story? Mm. You're really uh, quite an evil human being if you're denying that person of a personal story. So it's, it's a great equalizer in that sense, right? And, but certainly the realities in many places, it's, it's still not allowed. And I want to get to that point that, I mean, currently, right? I mean, we, we live in a very global environment. As we've talked about earlier, you know, global LGBT rights are in conversations. We see it more and more. What happens, especially in, in your case, in, in some of the initiatives that you've supported, what happens, let's say, for example, a, a company that works in Western context, right? Let's say mm -hmm. in the US-based company, and their stance having maybe like 100% in their equality index. Mm -hmm. But, the, but they operate in a, in a country that doesn't support LGBTI yes. rights, right? There is that conflict. It's a yes. big conflict. So for you, what are some of those HR sort of policies and resources yes. that you would uh, implement or some of uh, projects that you've implemented yes. through that? Well, if, if you're a company and you have the right policies, um, but you're operating in a company where actually it's illegal or even death penalty, I mean, yeah hard to imagine. Um, your policies will not protect mm. those employees. But being in, a, in an organization that you know has the right policies and is international also gives you the opportunity to move elsewhere. And sadly to say, I think that is more of what happens because those policies are not enough to, to, to protect. Yeah. Um, if, if a country's law is, is uh, so uh, abusive. Yeah. And it's almost, in a way, finding that perfect balance, right? Because yeah. it's you want to create that safe space, right, in, in your places. I mean, I was having conversation with, um, you know, being here, right? You're engaging in, you know, whether you're in the hallway having the deeper conversations about policies or storytelling. I remember having this conversation with someone about, okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a transgender woman. I now live in the United States, but I was born and raised yes. in the Philippines, right? In the Philippines. Trans people, you still can't change name and gender marker in your legal documents. Yeah. You know, Philippines is dominant in outsourcing business, right? And mm -hmm. I always ask that question, how does that apply for a trans person that's an employee, let's say in a multinational company that supports LGBTI rights, but then she's working in the Philippines mm -hmm. and then her ID, you know, she can't change her name and ID. How is she going to be addressed? Right? I mean, this is a question that's like, you know, positing to everybody. I mean, there's not an easy solution. I understand that. But it's always that perfect balance, right? And the person I was speaking to um, basically said, sort of alluding to what you said, mm -hmm. you have to find that perfect balance. Yeah. Because, yes, at, at the work environment, you want to create that safe space for people to be who they are. But the moment they leave work, yeah. They can't. they can't be that. And it's, it's a sad reality and it's a sad moment that, you know, one could only hope that we should continue this fight yeah. because in, in a global context, this, uh, we're talking about the livelihood of people. We're mm. talking about how it's connected to the economic output of, of, of a country. And here we are at Davos. Um, I'm sure we're all having this incredible conversation. I want to hear from you. What are some of those conversations that you're hearing here about, um, about LGBTI rights or yeah. especially within the global context? I mean, I, firstly, I think it's great that the WEF is having this panel. And I think there was a second one this week. And that's pretty new uh, here. And I would applaud the WEF for doing that. Um, but we, 
you know, th these are conversations we have to have. Um, if we were at uh, uh, the women's dinner last night uh, up on the mountain, it was beautiful, and some of us were talking about uh, the illusion um, of inclusion. And I thought that was a wonderful term, because you can have all the policies in the world. Uh, so I would still advocate going for the policies, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but don't think it's done when, when you've got the policies. And that illusion of inclusion, I think, is really uh, a good concept to hold on to. And I think the leaders that we work with, we're just trying to get them to be, ha have a higher sense of consciousness in the world whether that's about what we're doing for the planet, what we're doing about LGBT, about gender diversity, ethnic diversity, but you, you know, inequalities in the world. So we, we need leaders who have that capacity, that sensibility to have any of these conversations and to want to make a difference. And we've had people coming on our programs, a CEO program, where uh, so we've had some LGBT participants, which has been fantastic. But we've also seen that you can change leaders in quite a short period of time if you break down all of the barriers that we've all built up over years of being leaders um, and sort of shed all of that to say, no, you know, we're all humans here. We have to have compassion and empathy and curiosity about each other. And we have to be willing to uh, build the engagement, because I think engagement and inclusion go hand in hand in an mm. organization. So that's what that's the journey we're on with leaders. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. I, 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 I'm going to start using the, the illusion of inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then we do want to have those conversations, right? Um, how are we going to do it, right? Um, you know, there is a report that, that I read that World Economic Forum released that it would take 257 years mm -hmm. in this current state to achieve gender parity. And I, I look at that, right, obviously thinking about, wow. Yes. And I, I, I would love to firmly believe that this is why conversations about LGBTI rights, yes. about gender fluidity, about gender spectrum, because I think at the core of that study of, I believe, 257 years of gender parity. And usually within that context, we're talking about gender parity from a gender binary standpoint, right? Yeah. And what also comes with that is this gender binary, a woman is expected to be a certain way, a man is expected to be a certain way, having conversation, can a woman be president? We shouldn't really be having that conversation, right? But it's within, it's couched in that. And I, I, again, I would like to posit, argue my position, is that this is why we need to continue the conversations about gender fluidity, to truly understand that gender is truly is within the spectrum, yes. right? I mean, for so long we've been led to believe that gender is just this, you're only supposed to be that, you're only supposed to be this way. So, and it's held us back, why we have that 257 years. And they just want to continue that conversation. And if you have a wish, for next year, or what? Or if you could do one thing here, we have the power. We're two powerful <laughs> women. You're having a conversation. One thing that you would do? Oh, just get more people to tell their stories. And if it's people, leaders in in senior positions, all the better, because then it gives other other people who want to be their whole selves, the role models and the permission uh, to do that and to show that gender fluidity and and be proud of it. Yeah. So the more storytelling, the more people who can then feel comfortable to come out uh, would be fantastic. Oh, well, I think you're a role, <laughs> you're a role model and an inspiration, Gina. You really are. Thank you. Well, I think um, we should definitely continue this conversation. And if, if you know, we will continue the conversation, we could answer more questions. Um, but I think I just want the close out is thank you. Thank for being here. I love, you know, having a <laughs> sit down conversation before we entered here and we just felt like for a moment, oh, we're just going to be a little <laughs> in a little couch, you know, yeah. connected here. <laughs> but I love this conversation. And I think what you said about how much it truly means both mm -hmm. not just in corporate environments, not just in policy. It's like the, 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 the need for those stories, right? Each one of us have those and we're looking for that nuance, right? Exactly. And yes, we cover po policies, but it's the story that matter. And um, we want to thank you all for, for joining here. Really, truly appreciate that. And 
we will continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you all.